we have a real treat today because instead of having the usual situation where I'm presenting a case, uh, which uh, has its limitations, we have uh, the real, we, we've got a treat today. We have three uh, surgeons from the U.S. Navy, uh, and uh, that is someone who many of you know. This is uh, Commander Paul Roach. Uh, from uh, the Medical Corps of the U.S. Navy, uh, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Carver, also from the Medical Corps of the U.S. Navy, and finally Lieutenant Commander Ken Kingdon, and uh, they have all had experiences in <coughs> Afghanistan, I think all in Afghanistan, correct? And so um, Paul and I had talked in the past about there were a number of ethical issues that are associated with practicing in such an environment. And so um, Paul was nice enough to kind of organize this and, and get everyone here. So um, thank you all uh, for coming in advance. All right, so uh, I guess to begin, the first thing that we have to do is establish a context, a sense of place. And so I put together a quick PowerPoint, um, and we'll fly through it, just to give you a sense of where we were. Because it's so different than here, you can't even imagine. When we got to the, where I was at was, and I got home two years ago, and these guys got home just under a year ago. Uh, I was in uh, not Kandahar province, but Helmand province. So if you know, that's the desert in the south. And uh, we were, I was with the Marines. And these guys were in Uruzgan province, uh, which is a bit north and east of us, but it's mostly in the east of the country. Um, and yours was a bit more mountainous, but still uh, in the middle of nowhere. So where we were, uh, it was like the surface of the moon. And where we put our base was probably 15 miles outside of the Helmand River, which is where the only green in the, in the whole area was. There was just sand. Um, and both uh, Tom and Ken, uh, as well as I, we worked in what are called level threes, as well as level twos. So in the level threes, it's sort of reversed from the trauma levels here. Trauma level one is the highest here. Uh, in the military, a level five is the highest. But uh, a level one just means you're, you're basically under some trees uh, or in a, a single little tent. Level two is a battalion aid station, meaning that there's uh, a guy who, or woman who's one year out of med school. They've done their internship, and they're there. Uh, and that's a level two. Then level three is us in tents. So these are our tents. Um, it was a series of eight tents like this that were hooked together. And the design is that you can bust it down and move it within several hours, and then bring it up and start seeing patients within, what, eight hours or something like that. Uh, what happened is after being there for a while, it started developing uh, roots, because we started putting wood in there and everything else. So this is our base. And this is the moon dust that we lived in. And that was. Everywhere. When you go in a helicopter, that's all it was. It was a very, very inhospitable place. And the whole base, everything is inside these, these circus-type tents. Uh, these are, this is a casualty being brought to us. Almost all of our casualties were from helicopters. Um, and so the Marines, you can see they're wearing their armor because sometimes people will have ordnance still on them, uh, either intentionally if they're bad guys or unintentionally if they're like one of our guys. But you know, they have to be very careful, so we'd stand behind blast walls. And they'd bring us the casualties. Um, you can tell uh, as you're watching and waiting for the helicopter how bad the whole situation was. If the helicopter lands a nice, smooth landing, then you know, out might walk like a mom and some children or something like that. If it bounces, you know, a really hard landing, you know it's bad. This is the inside of a tent. Uh, you know, and this same tent is everything. It's lab, radiology, patient holding operating room, you know, but it's just a couple of these tents that are connected side to side. And we, you could see we started just building stuff. We would steal wood and steal tools <laughs> or bribe, and, uh, and then that's how it works out there. And then this is after a sandstorm. We'd have these sandstorms that could last for days, a day or two days. And it was like a snowstorm, and you couldn't see, uh, but it was, you, could, you couldn't see, I couldn't see the end of this hallway at all, I mean this room at all. It wasn't even half that distance visibility. Uh, and we get into every nook and cranny. This is our base from the air. And I'm sure this is just a lot like uh, Karen Tout was. Uh, these are IEDs. Um, and they fill it up with fertilizer, whatever else. And they would bury them and ignite them. And uh, 
Uh, they could ignite them just with uh, a cell phone or just touching two wires together. They could be pressure wired, uh, and they would explode, and they were extraordinarily violent. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Uh, our staffing for us, and this was just like for Tom and Ken, it was three general, one plastic uh, surgeon, two orthopods. Uh, do we have two? We had one orthopod. Uh, three anesthesiologists, uh, three emergency medicine physicians, uh, five critical care nurses. And for us, really, if they, if they knew where an ICU was in a big hospital, that made them a critical care nurse. <laughs> two emergency medicine and two ward. Go ahead. That's uh, Christmas time, and I'm sporting a handsome mustache. We all had a mustache growing contest. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so this is our lab. And you can see we can just do very basic things. You know, CBC, Chem 7. And they just did it right here in this little makeshift wooden desk that they used. Uh, radiology department. This was our x-ray machine. And when you pulled it up, it would fall over on the person. So you'd have to have someone standing out the other end. Uh, we had a nicer one that was very expensive, but it was too big and it wouldn't fit. So we couldn't use it. We had to use a little one. This is our ward. Uh, you just throw people on these tents. This is the uh, ER, and that's the ward. Uh, and, this, oh, and this is receiving. So they'd come in, they'd carry the patients on the, um, the gurney, and then they'd put them on here, and we would do our uh, trauma resuscitation there. And then uh, I think the next picture is the OR. Uh, that's the PACU. This thing is called the POG. Portable oxygen generator. So that's the lifeline of our, of our um, uh, little hospital is if we can't generate oxygen, we're in big trouble. So that sucker, you'd fire it up about 15 minutes before a patient was coming in, and you could create oxygen to put on a nasal cannula or face mask or an endotracheal tube. This, these things are unbelievable because you can lock them up during the dust storm and then unseal it. So that $500 hammer type of thing, is, it actually worked. Some of the sawhorses. Oh, so these are the sawhorses. So you'd put the gurney on those if you needed to. You'd use them for whatever else. And you'd operate right there. Or what we'd also have, oh, and this is the only monitoring device you have when you're transporting a patient. This is our operating room. And this is the operating table. You'd put them in there. The blood would drain underneath there and it'd pretty much drain everywhere. Uh, these are the arm boards, these little red things. Uh, the lights are fixed onto here, and they gave a candle or two. Here's all the medicines. Uh, we built this you know, uh, and to store things uh, better, but it all is designed to just hang off the side. And you do some horrific uh, operations in there. What I don't have is I, I, now I wish I had was we had a walking blood bank. So we couldn't store a lot of blood. We didn't have any platelets, and we really needed platelets. So when we had really bad traumas, we had a registry of everyone on base and what their um, blood type was. We'd put out the call. Volunteers would just show up. We'd pull it right out of their arms and put it right into the patient. And so if you go through 50 units or 70 units of blood, you know, 30, 40, 50 of those were from the volunteers right there. Sometimes we would give our own. Uh, there's our operating room. I'm sure the new hospital here is uh, a lot like this. <laughs> And this is when it's all packed up in these boxes. And you, you put it on the flatbeds, and the flatbeds put it onto a plane or wherever, and you fly it, and then you just set it up within a few hours. We actually did that as part of our training to get started. So. Uh, but believe it or not, in these little tents, we did amazing, amazing work. When patients got blown up, and they got blown up viciously, uh, or shot with uh, not just some little inner city kind of gun, but high velocity weapons that blew huge holes wherever they went with massive, massive cavities. Uh, if they came to us with the pulse, 95 out of 100 times they left, to, uh, left us with the pulse. It was unbelievable. Our statistics were phenomenal. And it's a whole team effort. So this is the helicopters that would, uh, this was our three helicopters right there. And that's the mobile trauma bay. We'll just quickly go through that. It's really pretty much a suicide machine. Uh, but it's a little, it's all of what you just saw in one Connex box type of uh, thing that can, uh, yeah. And he's a friend of ours who's an orthopedic surgeon. He was a Marine, Marine Corps officer prior to uh, going into med school. All right, um, MTV. 
That's, we had one rain the whole time I was there, and then it stayed like this for a week. Even the, the ground rejected the rain. Uh, and it got muddy, and all the Marines played football. Uh, this is Kandahar. Um, this is a regional hospital uh, uh, where we would t see patients and stabilize them and then put them on an aircraft and then they would fly to a hospital with actual walls. So that's a level three. Where ours went up to was Bastion, and I put these in because this is Kandahar, this is where Tom and Ken were. Uh, that's not an actual rink. There was a Canadian, it was a Canadian hospital, so they made a, a rink on concrete. Uh, this is uh, a KRMH. So this is uh, the only governmental hospital that I know of in Afghanistan. The only one. There was others that were staffed by Medicine Sans Frontier, but then they stopped being staffed after a number of those guys got killed by uh, the bad guys. Um, so this is KRMH. So if you had an injured Afghani soldier, you could get them here. But if it was an injured Afghani civilian, good luck. The only place they could go would be Bost or one of these uh, Medicine Sans Frontier hospitals. And once those guys got assassinated, then that became really impossible. So we ended and up, we had to yeah. sneak it. Because if those patients went to Bost, to the, uh, and uh, the Taliban were very heavily involved, they couldn't come from, they couldn't have been treated by Westerners, or else those patients would get killed or whatever. So we had to sneak our way to get them into those hospitals. So this is Kandahar area from the sky uh, as I was flying over. And there we are. That little gun is funny because I started falling asleep during the flight. Then all of a sudden, whack, 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 whack. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, it was just, <laughs> whew. It makes a lot of noise. I don't know what they were shooting at. but uh, So this is it. This is KRMH. This is the only governmental hospital that, that any of us know about. And I, there might be something in elsewhere. But uh, so this is their um, ER, I think. No, no, not their ER. I don't know what this, this is just utility room, we'll call it. Uh, a couple of their doctors. This is their ER. And you've got the expectant, delayed. Uh, the categories that we would give people, because you're triaging all the time, you don't just get a person and give them everything you got, because it just doesn't work like that. When a patient comes, you have to make a calculation. Can we save them? Can we not save them? Do we have the supplies to put into this person, or don't we? And that's triage, that's military triage, and it's very difficult. We can't spend all of our blood or all of our other things on somebody with you know, essentially a non-survivable injury. And this is a really difficult situation when you're in it, and we've got a couple of cases to tell you about that. So sometimes you put a patient in, and you just make them expectant, meaning you just comfort care immediately. You are not going to crack their chest. You're not going to do anything. Um, and delayed means you'll get to them if you get, take care of everybody else first, and then you'll come back. But you have to prioritize. It's a fact of, it's a fact of combat surgery. Uh, so they're, here they are operating on somebody. Um, and uh, you know the, the the sterility thing is very different over there. This is the medical trainer. He's an ER doctor with the Air Force who was there for a year, and we always have groups of us who'll hang out there for as long as a year to train them in orthopedics or emergency medicine. Uh, I don't know what the official word on how successful it is, but the people that we know have done it have a lot to complain about. Uh, he's the head of the pathology lab. Very proud of his lab, and he's got a microscope. Bear in mind also, and I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, please. We, we tried, at our base as well, we tried to mentor. Well, we would go through all these physicians, and then one day they wouldn't be there anymore. And as it turns out, they actually weren't doctors. And so there's no credentials. Somebody would walk up and say, I'm a doctor, and they would get hired by the Afghan government to be a doctor at this base. And I mean, we went through five or six personnel who we dedicated hours into training, and they just actually weren't physicians at all. <laughs> oh, well. If you've been there, you're not surprised. No, it's not yeah. Surprising. There's their pharmacy, all one, you know, 60 square feet. 
important people. Oh, so this is a pediatric case. Uh, Tom will tell you about it, or Ken. Uh, he hit an IED. They'd hit these playing at their house. Um, and so this is the sort of thing we would see. In this, and what do you do? Yeah, this is not unusual. Um, this child came in actually talking. He's, he was sitting upright. And I'll tell you, there's probably no stronger people in the world than Afghans. I'll second that. They, uh, they, um, they've been at war for 500 years, and uh, they're a little sick of it. But they're tough, tough people. The children are small. They're small until they're 20, and then they age exponentially. And so a 30-year-old will look like they're 80. But this small child was probably like 12. They look like they're 6. Um, they all, you know, if you saw an albumin over three, it was amazing. Um, and this kid was playing so all, from malnutrition, all from malnutrition, just oh, they're so poor. Com abject poverty. Can't imagine. This uh, child was, <clears throat> so they've grown up in the era of IEDs. This kid was playing with a bomb. They were, him and his brother were kicking a bomb because that was their soccer ball. And it blew off his left leg, and you can see the tourniquet on the right leg, and that actually was amputated as well. And you can see he's completely eviscerated, and this kid came in with a pulse, and he came in sitting upright and not crying, I think just because he was in such shock. And so there's several issues. One is, first of all, he's a civilian, so should we even be taking care of this? child arrived at the Kandahar Hospital at our NATO hospital, so civilian, pediatric, he's going to need an ostomy. Imagine trying to take care, besides the amputations, everything else, just an ostomy in a place where you can't get ostomy supplies. We would hook up people that ordinarily we wouldn't hook up yeah. because they didn't have much of a chance with an ostomy. Um, pouring on them. Because once they leave our little confines, yeah. they're off to the winds. You'll never see them again. Yeah. Sometimes you might catch them back months later and try to try to save them. But anyway, so you know, what do we do? If we had been overwhelmed with casualties, this child would have been made expectant because we can't dedicate the resources to this. However, he was one of three casualties, so we take him on. And I, I don't know if it's right or wrong because... You are setting this child up. At best, he's going to be a high AK amputation, bilateral. Um, in fact, I think one of his arms was also injured uh, with an ostomy, not to mention all the septic issues and the fact that he'll probably be in our hospital for a month. Um, but, we, but we operated on him. And uh, here was at the end of the surgery. So AK, AK, this is all meatball surgery. So. You clear out as much debris and dirt and everything, and his abdomen's got a vac on it. Um, and we'll bring him back three or four times before we close him. There's so much contamination, you can't imagine how, how far up into the tissues that the dirt and such gets. Um, One of the things about IED that's worth mentioning is a lot of them are buried in the ground. So you have this upward blast. So if it's a, a soldier or a Marine, their armor is useless because it all comes from underneath. Uh, these are what we call dismounted IEDs, meaning they're walking. Um, so it's underground, so you've got an explosion of rocks, and if they put in any, they'll, they'll put in ball bearings and other pieces of metal coming upwards. And it's, so let's say their leg is blown off here. There's a jet blast that comes all the way up, maybe even into their abdomen. Mm -hmm. Mud and everything is blown upwards, and the planes of tissues are completely destroyed. And uh, their genitals will oftentimes be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then you also have a fireball, so it all gets uh, cooked. So you've got blast effect, you know, um, burns, yeah. projectiles. Yeah, it's every kind of trauma you could imagine. Um, in our little tents. Yep. So this is Kandahar from the air. Oh, this is one we got these other ones Tom will tell you about. Yeah. So we'll think about that other the amputation kit a little bit more later. This is another child. This is a, that's a scalp wound. And this kid was another one of those emaciated uh, eight-year-olds who look like they're four. And I've never seen a scalp wound 
get infected. This kid came to us as a transfer. He had a GCS of seven. Um, was actually like gnashing, just gnashing his teeth. Didn't open his eyes. Uh, he, <clears throat> he was walking a cow. He was walking a cow toward uh, you know, a source of water. The cow got spooked. The kid was holding on. The cow took off. And the kid got dragged behind the cow. And so, you know, imagine bouncing your head along a dirt ground full of manure and, and such. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's acinetobacter everywhere. And so they just get horrible infections. Well, this kid was brought to uh, level one. So there was a PA, actually, who was staffing this small little clinic hospital. Um, tried to staple his head back together, tried to support him with some enteral feeds, which probably was just like glucose water. And after a day or two, he, didn't, he wasn't getting better because he had such a bad traumatic brain injury. And so he got sent down to us. And this was purely random. We, we didn't know he was coming. And they pulled this little kid off the plane with his dad. And so um, we brought him. And we had a huge discussion for, I mean, we argued over whether or not this is not our mission. Our mission is to take care of soldiers and Afghan soldiers uh, who are injured in battle. And here we have a five-year-old who may or may not live, one, because he's su such a bad TBI, two, is going to consume our resources. We had, we had less resources than Dr. Roach did. We had three nurses. We had 14 beds. And if you take up three or four of those beds, all of a sudden that changes your ability to perform your mission. Um, and uh, not to mention all the, you know, all the other resources that we would have to dedicate to this child. So we argued back and forth. Um, Thankfully, I won that argument. So we spent, Dr. King and I spent uh, two weeks trying to put this kid's skull back, to, or, you know, scalp back together. That was all pus. I mean, there's a little ba betadine there, but it was just soupy. You put your hand on there and just, it, it was like a cephalohematoma, except it was all pus underneath there. And um, this is like the day that he got discharged, which was right around Christmas. He was there for three weeks. Took two weeks before he opened his eyes. Uh, opened his eyes, started interacting a little bit. He's still, you can see, he's a little not quite there. You can see it in his gaze. He's a little disconjugate. But uh, this is one of the Corman men. That Corman took excellent care of, of that child, and that, that's his dad. Um, he came back maybe a month later because the, the, the local doctors uh, didn't want to take the staples out. The staples had been in like a month. And... Uh, you know, because we really kind of reefed his scalp back together. But uh, this kid jumped into the ambulance when he got off the helicopter and then came running into the hospital when he came back. So pretty amazing. I'll throw in a few more patients, and then we can get to the ethics. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's, like, no end of uh, ones we could show, so we're just being quick Trying to, just to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about. Um, Dr. Angelus and I came up with a quick strategy for where we would go. This is an Afghani. Um, you can tell because all the American military members have to shave. Not um, the SEALs. Yeah, not the SEALs, right. Uh, but anyway, this was uh, 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 through and through of the chest, and we're obviously doing compressions, and that's not very good. But uh, that would be an example of futile care. But it was an Afghani soldier, so we gave him, uh, we gave him what we could. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we got a little baby, um, and we got an old man. You know, we, we sort of, people just showed up. Uh, that little baby had uh, pyloric stenosis, but we were able, because it took so long to get to us, it was already softening. Uh, so just with uh, hydration and uh, tender, loving care, you know, and better lucky than good, we didn't have to do a sphincterotomy because he was already beyond that point where it was a lethal condition. Uh, and then, you know, these old people would show up too. And a lot of times it would be a village elder, and they're very important within their village. And that's uh, uh, very important for our overall mission. So we took care of, you know, hernias that were just like wheelbarrow kind of hernias and whatnot sometimes. Uh, this is a 15-year-old girl. Uh, I, we won't get into her today, but she had a through and through of the trachea just from some shrapnel. Um, but the uh, 
unusual thing about this was after I was done with the case, I'm all amped, and I go to talk to the father. Bada, 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 between the, the uh, interpreter and the father. The father's all upset. And I'm like, we just, you know, this was a great thing we just did. You know, she's going to be fine. It's all going to work out. Father's all upset, and then we, we part. I never find out. Father was very worried that, there, that I was male uh, and that I might have seen her chest. So the interpreter just had to lie to the father, say that it was all women in there, and she was covered, and I came in just to supervise, and she was already covered. Uh, because otherwise, if I had seen her chest, she would have, this is what the interpreter told me, kicked her out of the family, out of her town. She would have died or had to be a prostitute. And that's not, necess that's not Islam. That's the, some of the regional interpretations of Islam. So, you know, so what we did was we flew her to another hospital just to avoid stories conflicting, whatever. So I, that's just her operative photo. You can go on. Uh, this is a boy who actually made the New York Times. He had tetanus. This is another example of what we're describing with mission creep. He had been playing in one of the, um, uh, the little water irrigation ditches, and he got sick. And uh, he came to us with, uh, I think it's, uh, he had the rhesus sardonica and the opsitonos and all the things that, that heralded tetanus. Even I could figure that one out, that it was tetanus. Um, but taking care of him was a huge problem, and we had a lot, a huge major powwow, should we, because it, it took weeks of ICU care. Uh, we finally did uh, decide that we were just going to do this. You know, it, it, it was uh, something that we committed to. We transported him up. He was taken care of for weeks. Uh, but we are not, uh, you've, seen our, you've seen our tents. We are not equipped to be the regional medical center of the southern half of that country of 25 million people. Um, but every now and then uh, we did this, and, and some reporter got a hold of the story, and it made some news, but we were all happy to do it, but it took every bit of horse serum in the Southwest Asia. This little fella burnt his hand. I think there's another picture. So, you know, the children just show up, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, they just show up. Bombs could be dropping, and they just show up. Families will do whatever they need to do. So we didn't have any pediatric instruments, because that's not what we're equipped for. That's not our mission. The anesthesiologist snuck aboard the pediatric uh, stuff that they needed to deliver anesthesiology. And we did everything with adult size instruments. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. And there he is, a little soccer player. So we had lots of these. Uh, a little boy who we took care of and took the bullet out of, I don't remember where, but the bullet first had gone through his mother's head. And he didn't know that, and we never told him. Uh, so we had them for a week, and there was this little secret that we were all carrying. And you know, you can't tell them. So uh, this is my first patient. Uh, that's a, I think that's my first, you know, like a two-year-old or so. It looks big to be two. And it was a thoracoabdominal gunshot wound. It trans went across. And I don't know how this happened, but it, uh, it didn't, he was moving his legs. So it didn't go through his spine. His belly was out to here. And I thought, and it hadn't been. The corpsman or the medic was very clear that it had been flat when they picked him up. So I always thought it was just going to be a warm autopsy. But uh, it hit. It traveled around. It did not take a straight line. And it exited you know, out here. So the, the entrance was actually above the end. Oh, the entrance, sorry, was like like up here on the other side, and it came out right underneath there. So I was sure, but it, it, this little fella had a guardian angel. It's the only way I can put it, because a high-velocity missile, and then it also went into his uh, sister's ankle. And that's us. This is a little girl that I wrote about in these notes. Um, uh, uh, one little boy found a yellow-looking toy brought it inside. Her older sibling said, that's not a toy, that's a landmine. And they started throwing it, and it exploded. And it, we had about five patients at once. Guts are hanging out. One little child died. And you're suddenly overwhelmed in your little tents. And then they brought him up to where I was. 
And we took care of them. I think we've got some pictures. Um, ah, I took care of a, a couple of these. And this little, this little one here tormented me for like a week. I don't know if I said, you know, or white count went down to zero or it was horrible. But we did about four surgeries or so. And uh, there she is. And her little sister wasn't so bad. It was just like two holes in her leg. But um, this is a double amputation, um, just so you can see what that looks like. Um, we had lots of those and triples and quadruples. And we'll talk about that as soon as this slide shows over. That's a hand blown apart. I don't think even Dr. Gottlieb could do anything with that. Uh, this one is interesting because this is an enemy prisoner of war uh, and uh, a, big a big hole in his leg. And so we would take care of enemy prisoners. I mean, we would shoot them and then scoop them up and take care of them. I love you. I hate you. Come close. Go away. Uh, we would put in these little plastic shunts because the, the high velocity missile blows everything apart. It's not just a little wee little hole through the limb. It blows it all apart. And so you see there's this enormous soft tissue defect. The vessels are destroyed. So we'd put in, we'd put in these little plastic uh, shunts in order to maintain perfusion to the distal extremity. Now, it's one thing to do that in a uh, UK, Danish, American service member, because they're going to get the million dollar everything when they come back. It's another time in the Afghani um, in the Afghani soldier, because they don't have the ability to do all of that reconstructive work or the physical therapy afterwards. We decided, since we couldn't figure out what exactly to do in that scenario, that we were going to do everything the same for US and Afghani, even though we know once he gets to KMRH, we're probably going to cut it off, because they won't be able to do anything else. But we wanted to give them that little bit of chance. However, we knew the conclusion, but we did it this way anyway. It also avoids the perception of unequal care. And also in Afghanistan, there was a rumor uh, amongst the locals not to go to the US hospitals because we cut your arms and legs off. What? We cut off your arms and legs. Um, but uh, OK, so that's just to give you guys a sense of place. Um, and what I had done is um, I'd sent to Dr. Angelos late, though. Uh, I had, when I was there, I, I used to write up this sort of stuff and send it home to my wife and family. Uh, and then when I got done, it was like 50,000 words. And they were like, you should turn this into a book. So I sent it to the Navy. And I'm not going to, but they approved it. So all of this stuff is, has been approved by the Navy. But these are just uh, so narrative. Uh, I don't know, maybe, but I, Dr. Carver we're, we're and Kingdon modest. keep me busy. We're modest yeah. people. Yeah, modest they're, people. Because they're for every one of us, because I, I did the same, I have basically a, a diary as well. And every one of us who's been over there has done the same thing. And um, you know what? It's okay. It's something you just keep to yourself and share with your family. But it's not, it looks like, it sounds like gloating, and I don't. I don't. I, I think that's just why we don't all publish what we did over there. Right? Yeah, it's it's there's tricky. Potentially, there's there's yeah. books though. There there are books um, you can buy. It's one of them's called the Wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and you can get it on Amazon. It goes over case studies and and things like that. So hey, somebody's done it. What I did is I've shared with you guys, with all of you, uh, 15 pages or so of it. Uh, for today, and you can get it from Dr. Angelos uh, uh, online, and, and you're welcome just to read it. And, uh, and so what we'll do, the, uh, the first one is the issue of triage. We're going to skip over that, but those are the, the, the ghouls, sisters. And we also took care of her pregnant mother, um, which worked out very well. Um, but that's just triage. And we also had, at the same time that they came in, we had a few military service members come in. And who do you take care of first and, and whatnot is an interesting issue, but we won't talk about that today. And then what we want to talk about is a tale of two head traumas. Uh, I had this patient who was 12. 
uh, we'll call him Lando. And he came to us with uh, a story that didn't match his picture, but he had DAI, diffuse axonal injury. He had, uh, this was when I was at the level two, and he, um, he was neurologically, um, what should we just say? He was, you know, like a GCS5 or so. And um, the question is, should we just let him die or try to save him? So he was a beautiful little boy, a little muscular fella, and his father was with him, and he meant everything in the world to the father, and the father was there with him day in and day out. And we fought, and I, th I was at a British hospital. In, in Helmand, it's a British level two, and they're much quicker to pull the plug on patients than, than us. Tom was at Kandahar, and you had a little fella with DAI as well. So if you read through this whole story, you'll find out that uh, despite my fighting for him, we had to extubate him uh, and let him fly. And overnight, he did very poorly. He couldn't handle his own secretions, and we had to send him home to die. Uh, and that was very hard on me because I, I, I had kids this age. The kids were really, really screwed me up when I was there in terms of, you know, that was hard. Tom, though, the better surgeon than I am and better... Uh, Arguer, he managed to save his. So Not he'll tell all. about you know, that. We, 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 we were. Paul was with Tom the and Ken, I should say. So Paul's with the Marines. Ken and I were with the Army, and we actually took over a Dutch base. So whereas Paul was living in tents and rolling around in tents, we had hard structures. We had connex boxes. So if you see a train roll by with a shipping container on it, that's what we lived in. And we modified those, and they cut the walls out, and that's what we operated in, and that's where we ate dinner. And, and if I never set foot in another shipping container, it'll be too soon. <laughs> but you know what's nice about shipping containers? They're somewhat blast-proof, and they uh, keep the dust out better than a tent. But we had a different situation, whereas we had, we did have tube feeds. <laughs> we had the Army, the Army and the Marines, just as an aside, okay, the Army and the Marines have a much different mindset about how to go to war. The Army is going to bring your couch and the chairs and all the TVs, and the Marines are going to bring bullets. <laughs> and that's how that goes. They bring tents not, for, not to keep everybody dry. They keep tents to, bring, to keep the bullets dry. All right? The Army, they yeah. bring everything because they can. So... We, we had the luxury of being in an army base, so we had a little bit more materials. There still was a, a heated debate, and I think Dr. King and I kind of were like, you know, this kid, we can, we, we can do all right, right? But right. I mean... So there was actually a third surgeon yeah. with Dr. Carver and I, who was a cardiothoracic, who had been our chief when we were younger surgeons, and we had a very heated debate between the three of us about whether it was appropriate to take care of the kiddo from a resource standpoint, which we've talked about a lot that's the one of the big issues but the other issue is from the standpoint of is the family able to take care of the kiddo afterwards are we actually causing more pain taking care of the kiddo in the long term than not that's another big issue you know you think it's just life and death but if they can't handle the kiddo are we actually just making it worse is he going to get abandoned on the side of the road is the family going to get killed or these kind of things so there's a lot more to think about than just life and death of the kiddo and so that's where the argument came from and the third surgeon really thought that we might be doing a little bit more harm um, and um, we really just sort of flipped a coin, basically. I think Dr. Carver was on when the patient came in, so that's how we decided what to do. Um, and I think that'll bring us to our next. I hope, are, did you guys want to, are we just talking, and is that okay, or did you want to jump in if you? Keep talking. All right. <laughs> so... Uh, Oh, this is the little child, and the issue is with the children, what we call mission creep, which is we're sent there to do a mission, and that mission isn't to take care of everybody in that country. It's to take care of the, the um, fighting forces, and you have to do that, and you have to, you have to be disciplined and stick to that, but what are you doing? you got a child with a gunshot wound, you know? So that's a really difficult ethical issue that we all dealt with pretty frequently. We just try to treat everybody the same, right? And that sounds like an easy thing to do, but it is not. Um, and I, I think one, one case, and we didn't bring up a lot of this, but head injuries in Afghanistan, in Kandahar and Bastion, they had neurosurgeons, right? So the neurosurgeons would do these operations. No, only at Kandahar. Oh, Bastion didn't have them. Oh. I did four craniotomies, but that was me. <laughs> You're the local neurosurgeon. 
we, you know, we, we, had a, we had a neurosurgeon. We had a lot of head injuries. We would s save them. And Kandahar, bear in mind, the, the hospital in Kandahar, which is a beautiful structure and is as capable as Cook County in terms of trauma. In fact, we did more massive transfusions in Kandahar than they do at Shock Trauma or at Cook or anywhere else in the world for that matter, except maybe South, you know, South Africa. Um, the head injured, we would get them to a point that they would, you know, from our standards, they would be ready to go to rehab. And we would move them to that KRMH that Dr. Roach was talking about, and they would die in three or four days. Mm -hmm. Because there is no possible way you can maintain that amount of care. Even just tube feeds, even just IV hydration, let alone aggressive OT and PT and speech therapy, which doesn't exist. You know, occupational therapy is feed yourself. And if you can't feed yourself, you're going to die. And so when you know, we talk about these hard decisions that we make, the hard decision was, do we let this poor child just expire with a morphine drip, which in some ways is maybe better, or do we get them to the point that you know, they have a survivable in injury now, but they die because the local resources cannot handle you know, the basics? So here's one. I was in my tent. It was my last day. Uh, before I was coming home and uh, a pack comes in a, a patient comes flying in and uh, I get the story when he arrives He's covered head to toe young guy. He's still alert and he's looking and he's quiet and he's look He's got this look uh, about himself like what is going on? And he's covered head to toe in, in gauze uh, and the translator tells me the story was uh, what he thinks is that he got doused in gasoline and pushed into a campfire. So uh, I go to take off his dressings, and it's just too painful. Um, and I'm stressed. I mean, actually, this one has really stuck with me. Uh, I know what's going to happen. I know how this one's going to play out. I'm going to have to tube him in order to do his dressing changes. And then I'm stuck with a tube in him. So I wasn't sure what to do. Um, but you know, when you're out there, one of the other things that happens is just the current, the momentum. Even though you're not necessarily busy, you handle things pretty quickly, typically, because you might be real busy the next moment. And you don't sit around, and you don't have the luxury of an ethics conference about what to do with this guy, and you don't have you know, any, any uh, time to to think. So I looked at him, and I before I took off his his uh, dressings, I made my peace with it as best I could that that he's going to die, and it's going to be through me. Because there's no way we couldn't just put him in our tent right there and let him dehydrate slowly or, or die horribly. You know, you can't just do that. And there was no way we were going to get a helicopter because they would not fly an Afghan civilian who had been assassinated or partially assassinated to anywhere. And even if they could fly him to anywhere, no one's going to take him. So I told the translator um, an incomplete amount of information and told the guy that we were going to, I told the translator what we were going to do, but I didn't tell him that impact of this. And we told the patient, and the patient nodded, put the tube in, took off his dressings, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And he had 95% burns, almost all grade 2 and grade 3. There was really no grade 1. The only thing that wasn't burned, really, was this little section right here. And, and there's nothing you're going to do about that in Afghanistan. So I gave him a morphine drip. And I took him off the machine. And I dealt with it as much as I could. And this one really hurts, because uh, that was a human being. He was in his 20s. you know. But what can you do? You were stuck. Now that you've seen the pictures and you've seen the environment, if anyone has a better solution, that's what I'll do next time. But uh, you know, it's hard to know. It feels to me like euthanasia or a coup de grace. But, uh, you know, it wasn't letting him 
Right. It wasn't, it wasn't where I took his dressings, did a dressing change, and then let him wake up and just put him in a corner and let him sort of, you know, or gave him what therapy we could. We took over a Dutch base. The Dutch had a, um, you know, they, it's interesting, they, because they're active in euthanasia, and they had a, a <coughs> poster or like a pathway on the wall for these severely burned, severely head injured patients where you kept titrating up the Ativan and morphine to the point that they eventually were apneic. And I think it was more as a ramp it up so that we don't use all of our resources and let this patient, who is going to die, inevitably they're going to die, let's speed that up so we don't keep drips and fluid and stuff going. We didn't adopt that path, but it was on the wall in the ICU. Which will bring us to the last one, and I'm sorry we're going over. But this is, uh, this is one of my patients. Um, he, had, uh, he was crossing a bridge, and um, the bridge had an IED underneath it, and somebody, I don't know if it was pressure plate or uh, remote detonated, but blew him up. And he comes to me, and he's got two high amps. Well, he's, I mean, you saw the, he, he, he comes a complete mess. Uh, but he, he leaves me with two high amps, uh, an amp above the elbow here, and then an amp here, and then I put a shunt in the brachial artery and vein as well so that he could at least have one joint. Um, and when he came to me, oddly enough, he was screaming, hellfire. It was the most horrible scream of my life. And he was wide awake. Uh, of course, there's no place to put an IV. So I put in subclavian catheter, you know, just, you just, he's already hurt so bad, you don't bother with the lidocaine, you just put it in. Um, and uh, we tanked him up, and then the guy on the other side of the table was able to get his. Uh, and when I was done, because when it happens, you just go. And then when you're done, and you're cleaning up, because you're covered in blood, um, you're thinking, well, Oh my God, what have I just done? It was horrific. It was just the most horrific thing. And so it wasn't until I was preparing for this that I just Googled his name. And, uh, and it hit me. It was this unbelievable release. He's on web pages. He's got interviews with Gary Sinise. Some foundation has bought him a house. You know, he's apparently got this incredibly positive mindset. But that was two years that I've always been wondering. In the end, life is still life. And uh, whatever we can do, we owe it to these people. And we will, you know, we, we're working in a combined VA Navy hospital. And we see the Korean vets, if they're still around, uh, the Vietnam vets, Gulf War One, and and they have a lot of issues. Uh, so I'll just end with this in terms of ethics that I think as a nation we are morally bound to take care of these vets, and it's not always easy, especially with all the psychological stuff. Um, as you've seen from the events of last week, the psychological trauma is is horrible uh, for a long, long time. But thank you all very much. Sorry to keep you late. If you have any questions, just grab us afterwards. In the field, there are now combat psychologic teams that are in the field at some of these bases. Certainly where Tom and I were at it, most of the level twos and certainly level threes that they can come and see. And there are certain automatic things that when they, a certain experience occurs, they're automatically supposed to be sent by the commander to, or by folks to see these teams, not just healthcare workers, but anybody. Um, but some of that's very dependent on who the commander is and who they're around, so it's, it can be shoddy. It's, it's supposed to be automatic, but, you know, in the tides of war, things, things get mixed up a little bit, I would say. Well, we had a, uh, a plywood wall between the OR and our recovery room, and, uh, and in the plywood wall, we had just written all the names of the guys who had gone through and who we had operated on and who had died. Um, uh, you know, and... A lot of times they would bring us somebody and we knew they were dead, but they had gone through such an ordeal 
to get us, to get that person to us. But we knew they were gonna die. You know, we would do the operation anyway, just because they were there, hoping. You know, it would be completely demoralizing not to do this. So it was, in one sense, futile care, but in the other sense, you can't demoralize these people because they have to go right back out in there. In fact, anybody who came into us, who was U at least U.S. military, we would treat them no matter what, at least for a short time, that's for unit morale, essentially is what yeah. he's talking about, so that their fellow soldiers don't think, hey, the docs just gave up on them, yeah, regardless they, of what you thought. They would follow them in. Yeah, you, you, these yeah. guys, you would have to pry them away from their friends sometimes yeah. just to get uh, help. So with the big, thick Sharpie, we put their names in unit, and, and, uh, and so we had this list here, and then on the other side, this list there. And it was something of a shrine. Before people would leave, they'd come, uh, and they'd say goodbye to their friends on that wall. And it was brutal to watch, and we'd always clear out. If there was any way we could clear out, we'd get out of their uh, space because it was very important for them. And you'd have a cluster of them, and they'd be going down, and they'd be talking about each guy. Let me thank you guys very much for coming. I think that uh, you know the, the level of issues that you're dealing with is so unlike anything that we deal with here. And I absolutely would echo uh, Dr. Kaplan in thanking you for, uh, you know, for coming here, but thanking you also for uh, what you do uh, for, for us as a nation. And uh, I'm sure if anyone has additional questions, these guys would be happy to answer them. So thank you guys very much. All right, thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, yeah.